Like I said in my previous video, people believe some seriously absurd things, and on this topic in particular, that can be very damaging. In this follow-up, I'll look at the quote-unquote science behind chlorine dioxide and at some of the more absurd claims related to this treatment as proposed by Kerry Rivera. The science behind chlorine dioxide, the most plausible explanation so far, pathogens, disease-causing microorganisms, generate waste material that is poisonous and creates the symptoms of whatever disease the pathogen causes. In nature, these poisons are mostly negatively charged, have a negative oxidation reduction potential. Further, the oxidization potential, wow, that's wrong. Oxidization, oxidation potential of chlorine dioxide is positive. It has to be in order for chlorine dioxide to do any oxidizing. The negative charge is attracted to the positive charge of the chlorine dioxide and this kills the pathogen. Of course, the good bacteria make no poisons and have no negative charge. This is just wrong. We'll have to go through some chemistry to look at this. But you can't say something is negatively charged and use that term interchangeably with having a negative oxidation reduction potential. These are two completely different and unrelated things. Chlorine dioxide does have a positive redox potential, but it doesn't have a charge. Chlorine dioxide is neutral, which is why it isn't written with a plus sign next to it in this very text. So yeah, there's no positive charge there at all. In basic terms, redox potential shows the tendency of a chemical to steal electrons from other chemicals. The higher the number, the better it is at stealing electrons. And the more negative the number, the more likely it is to lose electrons. Chlorine dioxide has a redox potential of 0.95. A high redox potential is what makes a chemical a strong oxidizer. When a chemical with a high redox potential steals electrons, this can damage the molecules whose electrons are being stolen. It could even result in a chain reaction of damage until the body manages to stop it in its tracks. Bacteria do tend to have a negative charge on their surface though, but that applies to both commensal good bacteria and pathogenic bad bacteria. So, good job? This whole train of thought based entirely on charges that attract each other is frankly very childish. There is a lot more to chemistry than that. Back to the book. Chapter 2 is just anecdotal stories of people attributing any amount of progress to the use of chlorine dioxide, and with no good reason whatsoever. Kids with autism grow and progress. They learn to deal with their difficulties just like any other person. As I mentioned in my previous video, uh, without a proper study, there is no way to know whether chlorine dioxide has anything to do with improvements made. On page 89, Kerry Rivera makes a poor attempt at distinguishing chlorine dioxide from household bleach and pool chlorine. Sure, chlorine dioxide is not the same chemical that is in household bleach, but bleach is not a particular chemical. It is a type of chemical that performs a certain activity. Chlorine dioxide is absolutely a bleaching agent, and it's classified as such. And then there's this nonsense in the part I highlighted. Chlorine and sodium hypochlorite destroy pathogens through chlorination, while chlorine dioxide destroys pathogens by oxidation. Looking again at the redox potential, I can guarantee you that sodium hypochlorite does plenty of oxidizing. It's a stronger oxidizer than chlorine dioxide is. Unfortunately, it is little consolation that this book promotes the ingestion of a chemical that is not quite as bad as household bleach. So far, this book has shown a severe lack of understanding of anything, and I only expect it to get worse. That's why I get seriously annoyed when people like this abuse quotes like these in an attempt to sound legitimate, or portray themselves as victims with a Galileo complex. This quote is attributed to Einstein. Condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. Einstein went out of his way to prove his theories and said that they should be discarded if they failed any test. All you've done in this book is make ridiculous assertions that can be easily dismantled with a basic understanding of chemistry and biology. Ironically, it seems that they haven't even investigated this quote, because it can't be confirmed that Einstein ever even said this. 
And then this one, attributed to Schopenhauer, which also can't be confirmed. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. I'd call this a Galileo complex. Oh, look at me, righteously fighting against the stubborn scientific consensus. You'll see I'm right in the end. I'll respond to that with another quote. But the fact that some geniuses were laughed at does not imply that all who are laughed at are geniuses. They laughed at Columbus. They laughed at Fulton. They laughed at the Wright brothers, but they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. Carl Sagan. And with that, we reach the wonderful world of parasite paranoia. According to the people who wrote this chapter, the vast majority of people, yes, 90% of them, are infected with parasites. Which is great, because he has just the thing you need. A protocol that stresses the importance of lifelong deworming. Taking into account the recent increase in travel, immigration, and trade across continents, it is not hard to see how the problem has now become magnified to an alarming level. Parasites, especially the modern toxified versions, whatever that means, may well be causing many of the rare diseases now becoming more prevalent, as well as other recently identified or growing problems such as chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and arthritis. Alright, I guess these people have never heard of the hygiene or old friends hypothesis. We know that as infectious disease has gone down, autoimmune diseases have gone up. Parasitic worms, or helminths in particular, excrete substances that modulate the immune system. The old friends hypothesis proposes that humans have adapted to the presence of such pathogens, and as fewer people become infected with them, the body doesn't know how to adapt to their absence and the immune system can overreact, causing autoimmune disease. Some substances that helminths excrete are actually being researched right now as potential medication for autoimmune diseases. There was a case of someone self-medicating his autoimmune disease by infecting himself with a certain type of worm, and that worked against his autoimmune symptoms. Up until the point where he took too much and started getting symptoms from the worms instead. And there is the reason why you should never self-medicate. The old friend's hypothesis is, as stated, a hypothesis, but... As such, it is meant to be an explanation of the objective fact that as infectious disease rates go down, autoimmune disease goes up. But no, let's totally cure all kinds of autoimmune disease by stomping out imaginary parasites. I added a link in the description about the old friend's hypothesis for anyone who might like to read more about it. So let's take a look at the person behind this chapter, Andreas Kalka. So I found his diploma, which is a degree as... Doctor of Philosophy in Alternative Medicine and Natural Biophysics at the Open University of Advanced Sciences, Inc. Um, so this is the website of the university. Uh, do I even need to say more? Of course, yeah, I will. This page sends you through to another site for all your university needs. They list their address in the contact info page. And when you plug that into Google Earth... It's a flat building. Yeah, it's a diploma mill, a fake university. As if philosophy and alternative medicine and natural biophysics wasn't dubious enough yet. Just take a look for a second at this guy's own website, just to see the kind of mindset that's going on here. He has this page about impossible mysteries, where he writes about things that he supposedly finds out about very mysterious things. And I just love this part. We learn that the sun is an explosion. Something mathema math <laughs> mathematicamente impossible. And the only logical possibility might be an implosion of gigantic size. So it would explain the attraction of matter and the stability of our solar system. This is ridiculous. Okay. No, that's not how the sun works. <laughs> it's crazy. And he says that if you don't subscribe to the doctrine of the pyramids being made by Egyptians, you will never have a PhD, PhD in Egyptian history because some kind of conspiracy. This guy's protocol leads you to take the full moon into account because, I don't know, worms might turn into werewolves or something. It's all kinds of crazy rolled up into one. What I found interesting is that while a lot of pictures of so-called parasites are included, 
Just one of them is believed to be Ascaris lumbricoides, but possibly a rope worm. But all other worms that are given a species name at all are identified as rope worms, and Kerry Rivera claims that the majority of the parasites found nowadays appear to be rope worms. Ever since she's heard of rope worms, they're everywhere. Isn't that a funny coincidence? One of the pictures was confirmed to be a rope worm by Dr. Alex Valinsky. Honestly, none of these so-called parasites even look like worms as far as I can tell. Here is a comparison of what they believe to be Ascaris lumbricoides with what a real member of that species looks like. But let's look into rope worms as a species and its expert, Dr. Alex Valinsky. Alex Valinsky is a mechanical engineer and associate professor at the University of South Florida. Apparently one day he decided to try his hand at discovering a new human parasite, dedicating two um, research articles to descriptions of its developmental stages. They're absolutely pathetic. Of course, he didn't manage to get them peer-reviewed. I've written essays more scientific than this in high school. Someone with a PhD in anything should know better than this. So, this is what he calls the first developmental stage. Yes, mucus. Kind of like the layer of mucus that is part of the normal gut barrier function? Nah, that'd be too easy. Clearly some kind of formless worm. But wait until you see stage two, I kid you not. Yes, bubbles are an integral part of this parasite's anatomy. In fact, they use the bubbles as a method of jet propulsion. Which stage you flush out depends on what kind of enema you use. For example, salted milk or baking soda. I'll spare you the rest of the stages, but there are links in the description to the full articles. Here's another of the many reasons why this article is pathetic and not publishable. There's no section for materials and methods, no results, just a tiny discussion with, oh, by the way, we did some DNA analysis and we got some results here with a 99% human pseudogene and some other results here that didn't really match anything. Brilliant. Before you take someone as an authority, make sure they actually are one. The hilarity kind of dies away once the realization sinks in that these are people's gut lining we're talking about. And parents are doing this to their kids. I'll leave it at that. 